Picture this, one day, you wake up without any memory of yourself, and while your brain's working overtime to process the absolute lack of things to process, parts of your body suddenly start fragmenting. That's exactly what this man is going through. He's trapped in a place where everything is pieced apart like floating pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. Lamps, houses, buildings, the room he's in, him, there's nothing whole in that place. He doesn't know where he is or what he's even looking at. But he's horrified. How the hell is he even alive? A guttural scream breaks out of him as a flood of questions come. Who am I? Is just another question he has no answer to. His mind looks worse for wear than his body is, which is quite a feat since it's literally fragmented. But even though his right arm is fragmented, the pieces are still connected. He can control them, along with the things around him without any problem. While he's piecing himself together, he keeps pondering his situation with a series of deductions. The man wonders at first if being put together isn't right to begin with, but he decides that he's not supposed to be in pieces. While he's walking through the floating bedroom, the floor suddenly fragments. Screaming, the man almost falls, but he manages to hold onto the edge of the room. He's in pieces, but everything's connected. He appreciates the concept a lot more now, but he sure as hell hopes that he doesn't have to piece this world together. While looking around the vast absurdity of it all, he wonders if it's ridiculous to think that he has a role to play in that world. Truly an inquisitive one. He then spots a woman's legs hanging on the edge of another platform above him. He tries to call out for her, but no matter how many questions he asks, she isn't responding. The legs don't appear to be moving, so he stretches out his chopped off hands to pull the other platform and connect it to the bedroom. As the rooms join together, he establishes that to him, it isn't right for the world to be pieced apart. He then moves to the other platform through the doors that are now connecting them. But upon entering the new room, he is greeted by the sight of the woman's dead body with a knife pierced through her chest and one eye missing. Kairu. The name slips out of his mouth as he stares at her, shocking him. He doesn't know who she is, but he knows her name. But through her name, he also remembers his own, along with a few more details about himself. He is the brilliant detective Sakaido, and he must be there to solve the mystery behind the woman's death. Meanwhile, beyond the strange place is a group of investigators headed by head inspector Momoki. When he learns that Sakaido's awake, he muses that he finally survived the fall in the bedroom. With that, he mobilizes his team, assigning Togo for general analysis, with Kokufu as her assistant. For periods and locations, he assigns Shiratake. The one responsible for analyzing people will be Habutae. In the meantime, Wakashika will continue to work on Kairu's murder. Their investigation is like a battlefield, one they have no plans to lose. As Sakaido connects the fragments of what seems to be a house and moves around to find clues, Head Inspector Momoki commands the investigators to monitor and analyze in real time whatever information he discovers. The detective enters a study and finds a framed photo. The team then processes the image on their end to investigate who they could possibly be. One of the analysts, Habutae, mentions that the people in the picture are famous celebrities from sports to influencers on the internet. They would have had no connections to their culprit whatsoever. Framed photos were usually ones associated with people being a family, but none of them were even related. Inspector Momoki warns the group not to jump to conclusions as they're investigating in the Idwell. The information they gather is essential and they cannot allow personal biases to taint them. A junior analyst by the name of Hondomachi cannot believe how detailed the memories are in the Idwell. However, the senior analyst she's with, Mr. Matsuoka, tells her to focus on the task at hand. He then gives her a rundown on what they have so far. Mr. Matsuoka says they've so far found five victims and detected the perforator's cognition particle at each crime scene. Hondomachi looks through the files and reads that the killer's modus is to drill holes in victims' heads. While his drive to kill created such a distorted world, Matsuoka clarifies with her that the intent to kill is the root of their impulses. However, when they consciously think about the murder method, it diverges significantly from the idwell. She then asks him if he has ever considered entering, and he responds that only someone who has killed can ever do so. Besides, only an investigator as exemplary and crazy as Sakaido is fit enough for such a task. Hmm… It seems the calendar the investigator saw earlier was a gift. It has the name Fujita's Wares, and there's an address on it too. Interesting. Back to the idwell, Sakaido meets seven people in the house. Habutae identifies five as those murdered by the perforator. They are disgusted that the perforator would have his victims participate in playing house. Habutai then identifies the other two as people who have been reported as missing. Still, one of them, Yuji Onuki, may be alive, given that one of them was only notified to be missing the day before. And the perforator has a thing for keeping his victims. Habutai notices a familiar reflection in the room, and they all gasp in horror when they recognize the face of another notorious killer, John Walker. The investigators send the data to Mr. Matsuoka and Hondomachi. 
who are already on the field investigating to look for cognition particles at Fujita's wares. Sakaido shows Kairu to the residents, but they don't recognize her and suspect she's just like him, someone who just barged into their house. This fragmented state is a regular occurrence in this world, which is why no one questions this. However, he's the great detective Sakaido, and with his abilities, he is able to piece the neighborhood together. Putting it together, he can form the word Takoya, another clue. One of the analysts figures out that the logo for the Takoyaki house, Pot Octopus, matches this. They have four locations to work with, and they're the same neighborhood from the calendar. Meanwhile, Mr. Matsuoka and Hondo Machi drive to the area where Sakaido is in the Idwell working simultaneously to solve the crime in the real world through the evidence found there. Sakaido is stunned as the world in the well starts shaking again. The Wakumusubi detects the killer's cognition particles. Based on the readings, Hondomachi deduces that he's out to kill the two other victims. Mr. Matsuoka tells her to stay behind as he will handle the situation. The perforators drive to kill further fragments the world, which puzzles Wakashika. He cannot help but wonder if this could be connected. Mr. Matsuoka goes down into the basement just in time for the backup to arrive. However, it seems that the deed is done. One of the them quickly checks on the body and finds that he's still alive. They immediately call for an ambulance. The sound of a drill comes from the corner of the room, alarming Mr. Matsuoka. Back to the Idwell, Sakaido and the other victims are staring at Kairu's body. Everything is fragmented, including him, so it's odd that she's still intact. To the investigator's surprise, Sakaido commands someone to come out from Kairu's body, and the fragmented body of the perforator appears. Unfortunately, he cannot make an arrest because they're just in the Idwell. Wakashika is alarmed by the sudden appearance of an eighth person. It's Hondomachi. Hondomachi, while outside the crime scene, notices the Wakumusubi's high readings. By the looks of it, the perforator is just getting started. They quickly wheeled the body of the victim, Yuji, into the ambulance. Upon further inspection, the paramedics realize that the hole in his head is old. It wasn't Yuji on the bed, it was the perforator. He hijacks the ambulance and runs into Hondomachi, knocking her out unconscious. He then runs off with her body into the sewers. Head Inspector Momoki points out that the perforator drilled a hole in his head and survived. Now he's doing the same to his victims. Back to the Idwell, the disjointed body of the perforator makes a run for it. Sakaido fails to catch him due to the old physics of their world. As he stands there, Hondomachi comes out of the room to check on him. She then turns around and is terrified by the presence of John Walker. She runs inside, and Sakaido notices that the rest of the victims are cowering in fear. The team decided to shift their attention to the presence of this killer. Meanwhile, the team informs Mr. Matsuoka that there is a temporary allocation of resources towards investigating John Walker. Inspector Momoki believes that the perforator has made contact with the other killer. Mr. Matsuoka yells and tells them a GPS should have been attached to their devices. At this point, Chief Hayaseura appears and explains that the reason why they don't have trackers is that it will compromise them. When there's a call to action, Sakaido answers. He punches John Walker straight in the face, knocking him out instantly. Well, that was anticlimactic. Hondomachi finds herself bound in one of the perforator's hideouts. He tells her he is about to drill a hole in her head, so it's better if he answers his questions now. She is disgusted at him for drilling a hole in other people's heads just like he did with himself. The perforator explains that it's to make the world clearer. It goes into one hole and out in another. Hondomachi calls him horrible for killing all those people, but he doesn't care. What matters is the fact he wants to know what her little device does and the hole he's going to put on her head. Sakaido, in the meantime, is wondering why the perforator didn't escape right away. He could have just easily slipped past his notice. It then remembers the odd way he escaped. At that point, he realized that this world for the perforator is not disjointed, but connected. The room was locked to him, so he couldn't escape. He was also hiding from John Walker, who he was terrified of. The investigators point out that his missing frontal lobe may have something to do with his perception of a broken world. They suspect this is the root of why he even drills holes into people's heads. The team of investigators is now worried about how they're going to find Hondomachi. Mr. Matsuoka says there's still a way for Hondomachi to tell them where she is, but he worries that she might pull something crazy. Hondomachi tries to stall the perforator by talking about the origins of the Wakumusubi's name, which he says is coined from the name of a goddess's son. The perforator holds back as he listens, but he didn't expect this young woman to headbutt the drill herself. However, it's because of this that a new well from Hondomachi's Wakumusubi appears. The team quickly pulls Sakaido out of the perforator's well, so they can transport him to the other one. He is then warped to the new id well and finds himself in what appears to be a barren wasteland. Arriving at a new well, his memory fails him once again. However, if it's one thing he remembers, it's Kairu, and she was hanging by her neck. He looks down and sees a letter with Last Testament written and laid upon her sandals. He opens it and reads only for it to say that she killed herself. I guess there was no mystery after all. After noticing Kairu's legs being bound, a gargantuan drill suddenly comes from the heavens and pierces through where he is. The investigators notice Hondomachi's reflection on the drill, allowing them to locate where she is and the dimensions of the area where she is kept in the real world. After finding out, Mr. Matsuoka rushes to where Hondomachi is. As the perforator is intrigued by the Wakumusubi's ability to detect killing intent, Hondomachi 
that she is mesmerized by how having a hole drilled into her head doesn't kill her immediately. He then thanks her, to her surprise. The perforator explains that all this time, he thought he wanted to drill holes into people's heads, but after what she pulled, he realized that he wanted to see people drill holes into themselves. Mr. Matsuoka eventually arrives with the SWAT team. They quickly restrain him, and as they do, the perforator tells Hondomachi that if she does pull through, he wants her to come and see him again. The perforator, the Matsu Fukuda, has been apprehended. Inspector Momoki does a welfare check on Hondomachi, who they confirmed is alive and doing well in the hospital. What a relief! In the meantime, he wants to thank another person for help in solving the case, and that's Sakaido. There is a tired look on Sakaido's face as he listens to the inspector thanking him for a job well done in apprehending the perforator. Sakaido asks Inspector Momoki if there is a reason why John Walker appeared hollow. The other man responds that given this is a subconscious creation, it could mean anything. Sakaido asks him if they have any updates on John Walker, and to this, Inspector Momoki replies that they have nothing. He then offers to dive into the well and tells the others not to worry because this isn't the first time he has ever died in the well. Still, that must take a toll on him. Sakaido then reveals that he knows Hondomachi made contact with the killer because she suddenly became self-aware in the well. He theorizes that whatever she did most likely shook the killer to his core. It's obvious that Inspector Momoki is concerned about Sakaido's well-being, as he asks him if he is alright after he keeps on losing his memories every time he dives into an ID well. To this, Sakaido replies that it's part of the fun and that Kairu reminds him of his daughter. They're both dead. The perforator, in this case, knew he and his victims were broken, yet he didn't even realize his own world is. Speaking of the killer, Inspector Momoki is reminded of the time the perforator used Kairu's body as a place to hide himself. And because Kairu reminds Sakaido of his daughter, that would have upset him. The inspector tells him not to get worked up with the matters of the mind. Besides, Kairu isn't his daughter, Muku. Momoki puts him in his place and reminds him that his job is to investigate and not understand the killer's mental weakness. There have been incidents of others being pushed by Sakaido to the point of ending themselves, and he didn't want a repeat. Or, as Sakaido said, a five-peat. Foul, Sakaido. That's just foul. Sakaido reassures him that he doesn't want that to happen and that he can't be stopped entirely because no one else is as capable as him of jumping into the idwell. It will only give them more problems. He is then walked out of the room in cuffs by two handlers right after that. It seems that the perforator is the fifth killer that had some connection with the infamous John Walker. Chief Hayaseura states that it has only been six months since they launched Hura, the system that allows them to jump into it wells. But already they have peered into the wells of numerous serial killers. Togo admits to the chief that she believes that John Walker isn't even real, but a being made out of the shared characteristics of a serial killer in the database of Mizuhanome, their machine. Despite this, it is still a mystery why Kairu constantly appears dead. Togo then adds that because the victims appeared to be very fearful of John Walker, this could be a reflection of the perforator's feelings regarding him. John Walker may exist somewhere out there in this form. His impression is even so strong that he remained in the well. It's difficult to understand how anyone can even do such a thing and have such a robust intent to kill. Chief Hayaseura then tells Togo that they are now forced to investigate the matter of John Walker possibly being the serial killer creator. Sakaido sits on his bed, and the walls are filled with old pictures of his dead daughter. He can cannot get his mind off Kairu's body hanging from the tree. He sits back on the bed and promises to find a way to solve whatever is happening. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications. And leave a like it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.